Hello, my name is Sundar Bean and welcome to the 68th edition of Airhex TV. Today, um, some conference news first. So I attended the EclipseCon in Ludwigsburg, which was nice. So I delivered a talk uh, optimizing cloud-native Java with Jakarta and MicroProfile. And um, I noticed that we only had a half an hour time, so I even prepared some slides to set everything in context and uh, yeah, and uh, there was not a lot of uh, um, hacking involved, uh, but at the same day I delivered a Java user group uh, a session in Java uh, at, in Erfurt and I actually spent two and a half hours coding uh, applications, deploying to OpenShift and, uh, and, and answering uh, audience questions. Nice conference, I met some MicroProfile and jakarta -y. Um, people and yeah, it was a really nice conference. So this was this one. Uh, what's also interesting? It's the very first time I I had the opportunity to talk at uh, an a JavaScript conference about progressive web apps without frameworks. And this is actually funny because uh, seems like everyone else uh, talked about frameworks. And uh, I have to say my my uh, session was really well attended. And I got lots of uh, nice and friendly questions. So I, I, I thought, you know, like end of world happens. And instead I got uh, productive questions and I was uh, able to answer uh, such such questions. So um, so really thank you and uh, for attending. And um, yeah, it was for me a completely new experience, you know, to talk to uh, JavaScript developers, not only to Java, Java developers. Then um, AirHex FM is, going, uh, is doing really well. It is actually doing too well, so it like uh, the traffic doubles, and uh, yeah, and uh, it is uh, costs more and more money, which is uh, very good because uh, there is more and more traffic going on. And uh, the recent uh, episode was about um, uh, test containers, actually, with uh, Kevin Vitek, and uh, and a little bit about blockchain, heavy metals, and RC cars even. And we had a double feature on Helidon, which is uh, similar to Quarkus, but sponsored by Oracle. Um, so we had two episodes and one uh, about more in depth talking what, what actually happens behind the scenes of Debezium, which is a really interesting project which converts database updates into, into Kafka events or Kafka streams. Yeah, and this was the first episode. And I think the episode about all data we, we talked, yeah, it was. and. Uh, end of September, so we had the op opportunity to talk about that. Okay, so now the very first topic is the following: breaking news. So what what happens is uh, the Jakarta Steering Committee uh, decided to have a big bank approach. So uh, what it means is that the Java X namespace is going to be translated at once to uh, Jakarta, or uh, I think it's going to be Jakarta name. Which is for me um, um, perfect news because uh, I think it's really good for ma marketing uh, first because we can say you know with Jakarta everything starts with Jakarta there is no mix between Java X and Jakarta and uh, then it is completely clear that in one point of time uh, whatever starts you know with Jakarta is Jakarta and Java X was the old dead Java -y stuff so um, this was uh, actually a very good news. Um so now let's see with the very first question. So we, we covered the uh, conference reports, Jakarta E, Big Bench, Big Bank uh, approach, and what is H? So this is a small but significant uh, release. So what um, what uh, the, the enhancement was the following. So right now what I had to do is in the what RC, I configured the fully qualified name of the application service with the deployment folders. And by the way, what uh, Watch and Deploy is, it's a tool which uh, just uh, listens to uh, source main Java, or actually to everything, source main Java, POM, and so forth. And on every change, uh, it will uh, uh, right now start Maven Clean install, and then uh, uh, create the war, and copy the war to the deployment folder. And the new release, what it does is, I can use uh, environment entries, so instead of using uh, here Glassfish Payara uses Duke, I can just use uh, dollar um, um, curly braces and uh, Glassfish Home or Payara Home, Open Liberty Home, Tommy Home, and, and Whitefly Home. 
So this is the main difference. So it, uh, it supports placeholders, which is a big deal for me because I'm updating the f uh, servers frequently and sometimes I forget to update the what and then in the next you know, conference talk and in the project, it just stops working because let's say the folder does not exist. So um, this is a, a short news and I think we covered everything from, the, uh, from, from that and then start with the first questions. Question and the Artsman is still is still not satisfied with the answer from from the last uh, episode. And what I told him, he can override uh, with uh, environment entries, the entries from properties. And then the idea is, if you have Quarkus which talks to Postgres, you can override the uh, config properties, which is a property file with deployment config. And the Artsman states uh, rightly that uh, if someone you know. So what is it? Um, hacker sysadmin. So it, it says hacker or sysadmin. So it's for him is uh, is uh, similar. <laughs> just kidding. I know uh, there are some, so this is just a little bit of fun. Technician from outside the team. And uh, the problem is they can actually log into the, the pod and see the environment entries and, uh, and then they will see the password. So what you could do about that is the first you could actually use, uh, for instance, Kubernetes secrets. So if you use secrets, what Kubernetes will do, it will mount the secrets to the pod, and you can still use microprofile config to read the uh, mounted secrets from a file system. I think this is from uh, TM, TMPFS, so it's like uh, in-memory file system. And um, behind the scenes. So this is one solution. But another solution was uh, suggested by com.linux, and com.linux uh, suggested to use uh, Vault, which would be also my suggestion. Uh, and Quarkus supports natively Vault, and it's in this in the version 26.1. And meanwhile, we have 27, so it's like you know old news, <laughs> almost. And the Vault project is from HashiCorp, and what Vault project does is like you know uh, I would say one password or, or last path pass for uh, for for backends for application servers it's a nice uh, uh, management solution so I would go actually this route and uh, by the way uh, com.linux says um, I really like the web component approach and not having to rely and fix version of npm and dependencies in the package JSON yeah this is what I do uh, for a long time on my developer machine um, I, I um, there is an npm on my developer machine but I don't need npm uh, uh, for in, in projects, actually. For that, the code is extremely fast because almost everything is cached, yeah. The question is, how you handle IATN in the web components? I could not find a reliable answer which doesn't need some package from NPM. So, because com.linux was so nice, and it, he answered my question uh, with, uh, with the uh, Quarkus, what I did before the show, I recorded a screencast on uh, YouTube... Oh, but I forgot to open that. Adam Bean. Let's see whether I will. Adam Bean is not the right. Oh man, Adam Bean. This that's my name, and this is my channel. And let's see, simplest possible internationalization. So and uh, yeah, it's it already viewed 173 times. And what I did in the screencasts, what well, is exactly what I did in several projects. Um, I, uh, what you can actually do, you can use your own attribute and, 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 and attach the attribute to your DOM nodes, which you would like to be internationalized. And uh, I use data attributes, so data-iatn in this screencast, but you can name it whatever you like. And data-dash is the standard extension. So this is uh, how it's suppo supposed to work. And then you can say document query selector all, you get all the nodes and you can use the inner text as a key and resolve it with JSON. And they implemented a small solution here, I think in three minutes, no, four minutes. In the screencast and in projects, we uh, loaded the JSON from the server, depending on language and so forth. And uh, it was surprisingly fast. You could also, go, um, yeah, this is, this is the basic idea. So take a look at the video. I'm really uh, curious whether you are satisfied with what you see here. And of course, and so in this screencast, I didn't use web components or custom elements because they are not required, but uh, you could you could actually uh, uh, package the whole solution in a, in a web component is even nicer because these web components could load everything from server and now and manage this for you. 
Okay, nice. Com.linux, thank you. And now the next one. I'm using JSR375. And this is actually great news. You know, if you if, if someone says to you JSR375, so what you can do, you can go to jcp.org and, and later to Jakarta E and just you know search for 375 and you get nice, nice PDF. What means nice PDF? Nice PDF means PDF like this, and what I did is I searched here, but the search got lost just for LDAP. And as you can probably see, you see the occurrences of LDAP, and I immediately found what he mentions here, the annotation of LDAP. And uh, the um, GSR375 has to come with two implementations, one LDAP, annota LDAP store and database store, and both are implemented or configured via annotations. What he asks me, as the, the actual question is, is it possible to uh, to uh, not do no statically, statically hard code everything in the in the annotation, and um, and um, and instead he would like to to use a programmatic approach, like you no know, read something from property files and set it on demand. This is the question. And uh, so the specification doesn't say anything about that. It just defines the uh, annotations, nothing else. So, but the nice story about uh, specs is there is a specification in the implementation. So what I did, I took a look at the implementation of the specification, and there is an LDAP identity store uh, which implements identity store with only constructor. And the sad story is it accepts LDAP identity store definition and it just uh, it learns from the annotation. So um, it, technically it is not possible to set it pragma pragmatically or pro pragmatically, <laughs> programmatically. And, um, but uh, the good news are what is uh, really easy to achieve is you could actually uh, configure here. So what you could do is you can, you can accept the annotation first, then override the values with system properties, no, wait, uh, yeah, with system properties, and then with environment entries, and you would even get, you know, cloud native implementation, and this is Soteria, so this is the, if you search for Soteria, you will you will find a GitHub project, and you can actually submit a pull request, it's very easy to, to achieve. And if you don't like, you know, to create a pull request, what you can, could do is copy over the whole class, and uh, and then you have it. So it's not you know it is not that dramatic. It's like 420 lines of code, and then you have your own implementation. You can configure with annotations or without. So it really depends on you. And um, it is what is the license? How to tell? Oh, it's GPL license. So with the copying, you have to be a little bit more uh, cautious. But at least what you could do, you can submit the pull request. Okay, I hope we cover that. So, A. Jim Shen asked me, what is the best way to achieve consistency in microservices? So the best, so the, 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 the easy answer is uh, microservices, or, or there is something like CAP, Consistency Availability Partition Tolerance, which basically states, if you distribute a system, you have decide between consistency or scalability. So you can absolutely have consistent microservices, but they 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 won't scale. So uh, what it means is, um, for instance, if you write to one microservice, you will have to block until the data is stored somewhere, and then you are, would be able then read from another microservice, which boils down to something similar like two-phase commit. So at the end of the day, you will have to implement something similar to to two-phase commit. A better idea is to get rid of consistency, or rather than, or, or not get rid of consistency, think about eventual consistency. And uh, what means then is, then uh, you can write to one service, and then uh, and then you know wait an amount of time and read from another service. And at one point of time, eventually, you will see you know your own data you wrote. Now, of course, what this means is uh, your application is not the same as before. So the, you, you cannot do this, actually. You cannot just rely on request response uh, model for that. So your, what you will usually do or would like to do is you write to one microservice, and if the microservice does something, it will send an event or notify you, hey, I'm done, 
and then you can proceed with whatever you did before. So this will mean you will be consistent, but you will have to rewrite your business logic. This is actually the answer. It's not like to try to block and you know replicate the data behind the scenes, rather than live with the un inconsistency, but um, you will have to, to uh, design the microservices from the beginning to, to achieve that. So next, the uh, question is, what is Quarkus? So this is actually really easy to answer. So what Quarkus is, this is super so super so supersonic, yeah, supersonic subatomic Java. So this is what Quarkus is. Answered, right? <laughs> no. Um, so what Quarkus is for me is this uh, a really interesting framework or uh, runtime, not framework. And uh, what it does is first. Um, you don't have to learn Quarkus because uh, Quarkus, uh, you, you can use a you know, microprofile and uh, microprofile is based on uh, Java -E or Jakarta. -E. So you don't have to learn anything new. So this is a big news. Otherwise, I would never actually use Quarkus. I wouldn't be interested in all, you know, to learn new API just to be a little bit different. So, um, but uh, the next interesting point is what Quarkus, the, the, main, the main idea behind Quarkus is that uh, there is actually no deployment at runtime. Deployment happens at build time. So what it means is what what gets shipped is like an optimized uh, runtime with a little bit tree shaking in involved. What tree shaking is is like a JavaScript term where they get rid of all unwanted um, unwanted um, dependencies. And in Java, at the beginning of Java, we had a term. It was called uh, obfuscations. There were lots of obfuscators. And the obfuscators were like uh, uglifiers in JavaScript. But what they also did, they get rid of all unwanted dependencies or unused dependencies. And this is what Quarkus does. It just analyzes all the dependencies, gets um, tries you know to uh, replace uh, dynamic behavior like reflection configuration files with just straight bytecode. And and what what's the effect? It um, it starts very fast and it consumes far less memory than a usual service. I would say in a hotspot version, comparing to Quarkus to Whitefly, which is fair, I would say Quarkus would be probably use a half of the memory. But if you compile it to a native, which is also possible to, with GraalVM, it will consume about 10th of the memory. So, um, and now is the question, should you care, learn about Quarkus? What are the benefits or drawbacks? First, the first benefit is of course marketing. So, you know, people ask me or, constantly you know java is or jakarta is too bloated and consumes lots of memory so then i launch quarkus show them you know it it consumes instead of 500 or half a gig 10 max and then your discussion is over so they see that it's very fast and nimble and then you can do your regular work with or without quarkus so i would say what 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 i do is is not like everything is quarkus in my project so i use still whitefly payara open liberty and in some particular cases, we use Quarkus. In some startups, we use Quarkus right now, and it works great. Okay, um, so I, but, so to, to answer your question, yeah, learn it. It's, it's fun. And, and learn means, you know, spend one day with it, and you know it. So it's not like you have you know, to invest two months to understand Quarkus. But if you would like to contribute code, then you have to learn far more. But just to use it is very easy. And it is very well documented. So it's well done. So... Shenoli one ask me, what is the difference between HTTP thread and executor thread? Actually, not at all. A HTTP thread can be executor thread. What is meant here, probably? I think you you um, you watched my micro uh, what what was called Java E microservices online workshop on Airhex IO, and uh, what I did then I used executor thread and explained the HTTP thread. But um, HTTP threads are built in threads on application servers, and usually there are HTTP threads. And they were called, and there are acceptor threads. Usually, you get one to two acceptor threads, and then you get a thread pool. And the thread pool is this where they actually think about that. You have a kind of a socket server, and the socket server accepts connections, and every socket is a thread. So, and what you can do, of course, you can just just with inside the HTTP thread, you can just call uh, execute the whole business logic. Or what you can do is you can have another thread pool which is just set up to serve you know your business logic and this is um why you should do this because there is a pattern called bulkheads so in micro profile you can just use a bulkhead pattern for for it for instance and uh there's even a uh, processor queue as an uh, sa attribute 
And what happens then is the microprofiler will start threads and queue it for you. And uh, so your HTTP thread won't block, then it's going to be responsive. So this is the main idea. And it's also a good idea to have you know two HTTP thread pools, one for the application and the other one like, like a sidecar for administration in metrics. Why should you not create non-managed threads in Java E? Very easy answer, because every thread consumes memory and threads are not visible. Um, they are just, just visible via JMX and, for instance, JVisual VM. And uh, what we sometimes had in, or one of my project requests will help us, we have memory problems, out of memory happens, and this was not an out of memory problem, rather than they started several hundred threads without knowing it. And this caused memory problems and they were like invisible threads. And managed threads, they are visible. They would, for instance, appear in uh, open metrics. I mean, uh, microprofile metrics, which is open metrics or Prometheus. So that's the main reason. Uh, so, uh, so the clear answer is if you start threads which are not managed, they're usually unbounded. And if you create your own executor service, which is which is visible and monitorable and managed. In the end of the day, you implemented your own microprofile spec, which is probably not worth. And by the way, if you look at the project Porcupine from me at the GitHub, Porcupine, which is a similar name to Hystrix, <laughs> you will find that uh, I, I implemented this once uh, to have you know monitorable um, thread pool. Now it's no more necessary because we have microprofile available everywhere. So. Robert Nistroy asked me, in one of your podcasts, this is the AHEX-FM podcast with Robert Scholte, and Robert, Robert is a um, Maven committer, and we had actually Robert. So Maven, this is Robert Scholte, this is the number 25 and 28. So two podcasts in a row. And um, where I was here... And Robert um, talked with about Maven Clean. It was funny, actually funny, funny thing. Um, as I remember, I, I delivered a microservice workshop uh, with lots of coding invo involved, and Robert attended the workshop. And Robert is the Maven committer. And then I, whenever I did Maven Clean, say, hey, Maven is uh, this clean is not necessary. Maven Clean install is what I usually do, and say, hey, don't don't do Maven Clean install. No, clean is not necessary. And uh, and then I say, no, why you know it? And say, yeah, because I'm Maven committed. So, okay, then uh, I just remember that. And for the workshop, I never did Maven clean install again. In the workshop, then Robert uh, Scholte then attended uh, my next assignment. And then I always did, you know, the, is, is Robert here? No. Then I started with doing Maven clean again. So um, the question is why it is not duplicated. And because there, there can be plugins which require Maven clean install, I think this is the only reason that uh, if you don't use any plugins, it's just you know, just a simple jar project without any code generation, nothing, then Maven Clean Install will work fairly well. Um, um, <laughs> Maven package or verify. And with um, Maven Clean, what happens then, it just deletes the target folder and generates everything from scratch. This is the main difference. So without clean, there's an incremental approach, can be incremental, and without the clean, what happens, what can happen, for instance, is then you end up having, you know, multiple classes in different folders after refactoring, for instance, and then if you package everything and ship to the server, then you will find problems. Th this is what can happen. And I don't trust the whole thing, th therefore I, I always do clean, I have to admit still, and Robert, please don't listen to this five minutes now. Because it sometimes happens to me that, you know, per accident, there are two classes, different folders after refactorings for whatever reasons. And then if I say, you know, package, everything is packaged and class is shipped twice. By the way, this is one of the, uh, wait a second, what, what SH? Um, I got lots of requests. Issues. And there is one issue, use verify instead of clean install, for instance. What I do in what I use clean install. And someone says, okay, I use please verify. And this is, <laughs> as Robert Scholte keeps repeating, use clean install is a bad habit from the past. So, um, And what I will probably do is here, because I really would like to have clean install, I would probably make it configurable. So, um, okay. 
No. This is like the Robert Schultz is the ghost of 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 clean install. We're almost Halloween, you know. So yeah, exactly. We have uh, air hacks, uh, almost Halloween edition. So. Um. Okay, I think this is clarified, right? So then G. Burent asked me, let's assume that you are building a service. And by the way, G. Burent uh, spotted an error in um, in my recent blog. Thank you for that. And uh, just a short explanation. So what I did is I actually wondered whether how, how hard it would be to use the interface for uh, or the um, REST client for system tests. So I could use the interface instead of my usual approach, Jack Suarez client, and it works, of course. And what I did, I started with an interface, and I think it was Earhex service, and the and the uh, name was fetch. And then I say it's actually not a service, and fetch is misleading, because it almost sounds like uh, JavaScript. And, and, and I wrote the code, but afterwards, I renamed this in a blog post, which you never do, and the interface was website content and I th think I used here fetch and G Burent immediately spotted that and I corrected a blog post so thank you for that and he asked me uh, let's assume that you are building a server and you have to deploy it on bare metal servers using either of the below since I would like to use out of the box auto scaling feature I would consider the se second and third option I wouldn't consider docker swarm and the reason for that is because uh I mean, the company, the Docker company, is smaller than the others, and um, and uh, I, I would rather bet on plain Kubernetes or OpenShift or something like that. This would be my my perception. My question is, OKD, um, this is uh, origin Kubernetes deployment, I think. OKD OpenShift puts another layer of abstraction on top of Kubernetes. Is it worth using OKD OpenShift with the extra layer complexity? This is a good question. So actually, so far, I prefer OpenShift over plain Kubernetes. It is easier to install. Um, you get optional support from, uh, from, from Red Hat, which is, for me, a big deal because lots of my clients uh, run already know JBoss or some supported piece of software. And um, if you would just use an open source version, uh, someone from the team will have, you know, full-time commit to the whole thing and just look for the patches and patch the whole thing or at least, you know, so either you have time or you have money. So there's the decision. And if you use OpenShift, you can still design, you know, uh, I could start without support and then migrate to a supported solution later, let's say. So um, so my personal opinion would be, I would start, I think OpenShift is also nicer. It comes to this OC tool. Is um, This is, is, is similar to kubectl. But uh, or CubeSat CTL, but uh, it comes with uh, additional OpenShift features. And um, but if you have OpenShift, you will still have to understand Kubernetes. So for me, the Kubernetes and OpenShift is more like you know Kubernetes would be like bare metal, let's say uh, Linux, and OpenShift is more like I would say Ubuntu on steroids or something like this. Is a nicer Linux, but it's still Linux, you know. So this is what how, how I uh, understand both. And having said that, most of large companies I know run OpenShift and plain Kubernetes is, is is not as widely spread as you know OpenShift. So this is so th this is um yeah. But you can start with either way, you know, you can start with kubectl plain in your machine, just you know, to, to play with it. And OpenShift already comes with nice, you know, user interface and so forth. So uh, it's really but I, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I prefer OpenShift. Okay. Um, Guip HH uh, says thank you for the podcast. So thank you for listening. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm really surprised how popular the podcast got. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so um, I, so the question is, I've created a Quarkus app. I'm using FreeMarker, which is a nice template language. HTML frontend because I find it simple and easy to implement. Yes, yeah, it's nice. Is it a good approach and how to secure my app for CSR uh, cross site? Uh, so, um, how is it called? C I forgot actually what uh, what the um, acronym is uh, pronounced, but this is uh, uh, cross site scriptings on, on request forgery, as is a cross site request forgery, I think, and X and so on. 
Do I need to use JavaScript only and post JSON? So the question is, what do you do with the free markers? So if you create complete site, you know, what happens behind the scenes? How you are sending data back to the server? How you communicate with the server with free market? Because free market for me is more or less like JSP, Java server page. And, and you are generating HTML with JavaScript. And the question is how you communicate with the backend. So I would say what I would do is just, I still don't know why you are using free market. What I will do is I would just, you know, use plain vanilla web components in the front end to communicate with Quarkus via REST and JSON. Um, or you could just use uh, GSF. I mean, it's still okay. And uh, then you don't ha don't have such such problems. GSF with prime faces, for instance. In your Hibernate with uh, Panage Video, with Quarkus Panage Video, the properties of the uh, workshop class are left public. Could you ple please explain why? Very easy. I think this is the new pattern. This is a JSON B object. And if you have a JSON E object, this is a, a data transport app object. If there is no business logic insight, in my view, there is nothing to encapsulate. So the easiest possible solution is, is to keep everything public and just expose it. And when uh, Quarkus and Panache can live with that, even better. So this is like, because I don't like to write, you know, code without functionality behind. I've used for anhydrator to do a POC for ETL work. So the, my first question, do you like how it worked? So anhydrator, if you if you search for GitHub, is still a project. Would you still recommend it nowadays? I use actually uh, anhydrator all the time. For instance, uh, archive Adam Bean dot oh, com, I think. Yes. This is an generated by Nhydrator. So the data is fetched from Nhydrator. And I also think Airhex TV, yeah, it is, is also generated or the data is fetched from Nhydrator. So um, the question, uh, the answer is yes, I use uh, Nhydrator all the time. And NAS1 is deprecated. This is true, but we could replace NAS1 with GraalVM or something else. So uh, what, what he mean, means is what I, what I did with Nhydrator. I was able to implement uh, Java interfaces with JavaScript and I use NAS1 for that, and NAS1 is going to be deprecated. So in GraalVM, I could use just uh, Graal for that. Um, so if it works for you and if it works well, just keep anhydrator and the implementation is very, very simple. And you, you don't even need, you know, um, for instance, if you have something like Quarkus, you don't even need uh, JavaScript because it's so fast that you can replace the Java classes on the fly. So I mean, on the fly, on the next call. So it doesn't matter. Next one, Cibar Garcia asked me, hi, uh, hi Adam, I'm looking um, looking at the specs in MicroProfile Config Open API Health Checks Matrix. Do you recommend include and use them in a monolithic Jakarta -E app, single war? Of course, this is what I do all the time. So, and uh, actually, uh, I would say a, the, a monolithic single war, thin war, Jakarta e app is the way you should start. And I would absolutely use all the micro profile APIs on top of a Jakarta e. And I would start with a monolithic war first and then see whether it makes sense to you know, add a new microservices to it. So for me, it's not like you know shipping 20 microservices is, uh, is a kind of best practice. Because if application servers like Payara, Wildfire, or Tommy already includes them, we can use them and keep our war thin. Absolutely. This is what I do always. So if you look at my um, talks, this is what I'm doing, actually. What are the benefits of these libraries in a monolithic apps? I mean, config, you can configure your application with add inject config property. Open API, you get a swagger for free. Health checks, um, yeah, liveness and readiness probes, you will know not only when the server is up, but also, it is. Uh, it was uh, fixed in. Uh, this is what I learned at EclipseCon in Ludwigsburg. Is that uh, I think after MicroProfile one three, now the health checks. Uh, if you go to the health of the monolithic application server, you get four hundred back in case uh, the service was not deployed yet. So um, and uh, matrix, you get Prometheus matrix. So I have to admit, this is what I do in eighty percent of my time. I use you know the old servers with uh, with uh, microprofile on top of it. So, Dempile asked me four hours ago, so we have completed all the microservices connection system with uh, change data capture, uh, capture, I think is a CDC, 
and an Apache Kafka cluster and it's time to go to production. Do you think it is recommended to use OKD 3.11 instead of OpenShift 3.11? No. What kind of alternative do you recommend in self-hosted on-premise environment? Plain Kubernetes or OpenShift or take a look at OpenShift 4 because OpenShift 4 is going to be completely different and I think uh, they will, it, it is going to be GA next year in February, something like this. Um, so before you start with OpenShift 3, look at OpenShift 4 and it's co CRD code-ready containers or CRC code-ready containers. So this is what I would like to ch to check before before you, you know commit uh, a lots of resources to uh, OpenShift 3.11 and um, and Kubernetes would be also an option. And if you use a Kafka, check out StreamZ is like operators for OpenShift for Kafka. So I think we are done, which is perfect. And by the way, what I forgot to mention the very first time, uh, workshops. All the workshops are doing extremely well. So I, we get, you know, daily registrations and now the web stuff is catching up. So uh, we have almost as many attendees in the web as we have uh, Jakarta e Micropopper, which is always uh, very popular. And now even the web is catching up. So we can say, you know, JavaScript is almost as popular as... Uh, as Jakarta in MicroProfile. So with that, thank you and see you at upcoming conferences, um, podcasts, AHEX TV next, next month. Um, yeah, bye.